I know things you never see. You never see someone taking a shit while running at full speed. Come on, kid, get rid of some of them turds in the shit box. Welcome to the Bathroom Break Podcast with me, Rab himself. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Rab from the Bathroom Break Podcast. Just wanted to take a minute to thank you all for listening to the podcast. It's been a lot of fun to sit down with some really interesting people and shoot the shit, you know, talk all that poop and stuff. But uh, yeah, we want to try and make this thing better for you. So we're going to need to raise some funds. If you head over to greengate.bigcartel.com, there's a donation link there. If you feel so inclined to donate to the Bathroom Break Podcast, awesome. If not, sit back and listen. We're going to talk some crap. Hello and welcome to the Bathroom Break Podcast. I'm your host, Rab himself, and I'm sitting here with movie producer, director, cinematographer, a whole bunch of things, a pilot as well, uh, Dave, David Thies, Dave Thies as I know him. Uh, he recently produced the movie The Peanut Butter Falcon, and uh, that's coming out in theaters in August. Pretty cool, man. We're excited. We're excited to get going there. We just uh, dropped the trailer last week, um, and it's... It's done really well. I mean, I I want to say we're not surprised, but we're surprised. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You work on something for five years and four years, and you know everything. Everyone's it always it makes it seem like it's an overnight you know success, but yeah, you know the trailers to me is a success. Any film that gets finished to me is a success, whether it's a five thousand dollar budget or obviously a two hundred million dollar budget. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like we were talking about that a little bit before it started. It, it is crazy just the whole process of getting it from start to finish. And uh, and yeah, I mean, it is a surprising thing because as you're making it, like it could be like when you're reading it on the paper, it's like this is the best script I ever read, and then you can totally mess that up, <laughs> you know. And there's some scripts that you read and you're. 20 30 pages into it and you're like how many pages oh, 118 okay let me keep going these guys mike and tyler the director writers sent me the script i knew mike from i had dp'd a visa olympic commercial uh back in 2008 and mike was the uh one of the part of the editing team on that and they sent us up to lake placid to the olympic training center during the summer and we were shooting the aerial skiers doing all their flips and stuff into pools yeah and uh mike and i just sat there and talked and we just kind of hit it off and then we started doing some projects that he was doing on the side together um he's a really really good editor and uh turned out to be a good director um and he sent me the script that he and tyler had written um this, this is probably four and a half years ago now and just going through it um He's like, hey, man, you wanted you to read the script? And I was like, cool. I didn't get around to it. Didn't get around to it. And like three <laughs> yeah, or four yeah. months goes by, and he calls me up, and he goes, dude, just read the script already and let me know if you're interested in it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, all right. And it's like, I don't know what was taking me so long. I don't know if I felt bad that if I didn't like the script, I had to tell a good friend. Yeah, it's yeah. It's not there. But realistically, that's being a good friend, so I guess I was being a bad friend. Um, <laughs> so I sat down to read the script, and just in like... 45 minutes I think it was the fastest script that I had read yeah. you know I tend to read stuff go back maybe make some notes go back and try to figure out who the characters are where they are um, and I just read it and it was just over and I didn't want it to be over that's, and that's good. you know it teared up a couple of times and, and you know it's the movie's called The Peanut Butter Falcon and it's about a 22 year old kid named Zach who um, has Down Syndrome and due to state budgetary laws or whatever, it takes place in the Outer Banks um, in North Carolina. Um, he's put in an old folks home. And so it basically it's him running away from the old folks home because he wants to become a professional wrestler. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's just kind of a fun concept in its own, you know, that it's like, oh, my God, he's going to, you know, wants to become a professional wrestler. Hell, yeah, why not? Yeah. Um, so I read the script and, you know, was just really moved. And I called him called him right away after a few months and was like dude the script is phenomenal this is really really good and he was like cool what do we do i was like uh yeah i mean he's like we want you to produce it and i was like okay i was like well you know i've don't have a whole lot of experience i had shot a couple of movies um did one for um upright citizens brigade called freak dance 
that we oh, shot back shit. in 2010. It was <laughs> a lot of fun. It was directed by uh, Neil Mahoney and Matt Basser, uh, co-directed that one. I don't know what it is with co-directors that I've got going on here. Yeah, yeah. Um, Damn, I got to check that out. <laughs> that is that is a funny, funny movie. We yeah. shot it in like 14 days, and it was kind of making fun and having fun with the movies like Step Up. Um, yeah. And then there's a little tribute to Warriors the movie yeah, where yeah. there's a big dance off mountain in, in play. the yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so there's a big thing where all these people come and we end up at the pink motel and shoot the big scene at the pink oh, motel yeah. so a lot of skaters will know the pink motel um so it was cool so i read the script i said hey if this was me i've got first time directors first time writers really they had done uh the moped uh diaries a short yeah. that had done well for them a few years be- before that and uh I was just like, let's go shoot a fake movie trailer, a proof of concept. Right. And let's go get something that A, can show that you guys can direct, and that B, because they wrote the movie for Zach Gottsagen, the star in this movie. Okay. Um, who, so, so they knew him, or, or how did yeah, that? Yeah, they had, uh, Zeno Mountain Farms was an organization that had helped, um, they had helped with where uh, they made a short movie, you know, with Zach, and they would volunteer their time down there. And uh, Zach, told these guys hey i want to be a i want to be an actor i want to be a movie star yeah and they were like cool but there's not a lot of opportunity out there for someone like yourself and he just said to him well why don't you guys write me something yeah <laughs> and they, i love the confidence yeah i mean he was you meet zach and he is he is confident and he's full of love and is an amazing guy yeah. um and so they ended up doing it over like eight months to a year they sat down and a lot of the lines that are in the movie, uh, Mike and Tyler will tell you that when they wrote it, there was stuff that Zach had said, you know, to them just in there hanging out, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so, so we went out to uh, we went to the Outer Banks where it's written, and spent three weeks out there. We had no crew. Um, uh, an assistant of mine drove a Sprinter truck out that was painted up like the A Team. I loaded up my <laughs> Sony F55s. I had my Inspire One. I had I just filled it up with every tool, you know, toy that I've got. And I flew out, you know, a few days later. Uh, we didn't have crew, um, so when you do that, you got to kind of take what you can get. We wanted this thing to be pretty, so we shot in the morning light and we shot in the late afternoon light. Yeah. And we literally just would shoot in the morning come back and have a siesta we would look at footage that we shot in the morning then shoot again at night but there were times where i had the audio bag i shot it on a ronin one i had an audio bag between my legs i had no one pulling focus so i stopped way down like an f-16 so i had plenty of room to focus to be able to walk backwards um just one man band that thing it was kind of a one man band and um (laughs) andrew terry you know uh was there helping and I mean, a couple of weeks went by pretty quick, and every day we just were like, "Oh my god, we're just we're just having so much fun. We're just yeah. out shooting footage, you know, based off this script." And uh, I got home and was just like, "Holy cow!" You know, I invested money of mine in, and Mike and Tyler throw money. It's like we kind of shot this thing on a shoestring. Um, and I got home and I was just really amped, and I was like, "We we have something." Mike was cutting every day, so we were getting to see. We just yeah. pulled scenes out of the script. We're like, nice. oh, he runs away. We should show him climbing out a window. You know, we would go go to Home Depot, buy a part of a, a fence, <laughs> you know, that you know went up, and we'd take two C-stands and place it up and then just frame it so that it looked like the bars were on the windows. And yeah, then, you know, yeah. We'd bend them, and he would flop out and be like, all right. You know, it was like indie <laughs> filmmaking at its best. Yeah. You know, we got that. Let's, let's move on to this. And the Ronin One really helped... Um, made by DGI really helped the film because it gave me that steady cam style uh, look. And there's a boat chase scene that we ended up doing in the proof of concept. And if I didn't have that, it would just been all over. Oh yeah, yeah. And this stuff just turned out great. I mean, this is the Ronin one. This was a Ronin yeah, one. This okay. was you know we shot this four years ago, and the Ronin had just I think kind of come out. I'd ordered ordered it when I knew that it was coming. Um, and we had the F-55 skinny down, and I was shooting on uh, Zeiss Super Speeds, like the oh, first yeah. generation. The lens is about that big. I mean, yeah. I just could basically get it balanced. Um, and, you know, it's like learning to balance that three-axis thing the first time. Five days into it, I was changing stuff, and, you know, you get it to the balance, and then you're like, we're back at it. So yeah. we, we shot this proof of concept, came back, and uh, really was excited with what we had. 
Yeah. And I said, all right, guys, the next thing we need to do is we need to um, storyboard this out. Again, we're we're talking about first time directors. We're going to be going out and asking for four to six. So this seven, is after million. you shot. After we shot it, literally the day I flew home, uh, I'm from Cincinnati, and I flew back to Los Angeles, and um, there was a storyboard artist um, that had done all the Coen Brothers stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm going to reach out to him. I know him through a friend of a friend. Oh cool. Hit him up. Oh yeah. And he was just like. Hey, he's like, I'm in, uh, I'm in LA. Um, I was like, do you want to go to dinner? And we went to dinner and I was telling him about the script. I was like, it's got this kid, Zach. And, you know, Tyler, one of the directors acted opposite, uh, Zach. And, um, he was like, man, the story sounds great. I was like, yeah, we need storyboards. And, you know, he told me what his price is normally. And I was like, what's the friend's discount? They don't need to be, like, super deep. I just need to be able to storyboard this movie. He gave me a price, and I pulled out a check, and I wrote him 50% deposit and slid it over to him. And Damn. he was like, what? And I was like, yeah, dude, I need to move. Yeah, this move needs on. to happen. This this is going. Um, so the directors flew from North Carolina to Dayton um, to hang out with him for a couple of days as he read the script and called back and was like, this is good. It was really Damn, good. Damn, hell yeah. Um, and those guys went through and talked about each scene and did everything, and then he storyboarded it. Um, Tyler, one of the directors, is really talented, um, like draw, drawing, drawing yeah. stuff and arts and craft type stuff. And um, you probably saw it. You saw you saw a motor, moped diaries. Yeah, yeah. The way he did the transition scenes, that's yeah. him you know, doing that stuff. Um, so we put together these binders that had... Um, frame grabs from all the different looks kind of okay. did a look page yeah you know print photo printed page and then of what you had already shot what we had yeah, shot yeah, we okay. pulled frame grabs off the f55 yeah. the sony f55 and just kind of gave it a different look so that people could get a sense of you know this is the feel of the movie yeah um and uh so we put that together then we had a script in there then we had the storyboards um and then Tyler and Mike made these cardboard inserts to make it look like cardboard had been hanging out forever. They're outside driving over it with the car, oh, yeah, beating yeah. this stuff up, <laughs> looking for stuff that's already beat up. And just the binder that we had, you know, had character. Oh, yeah. Um, and then it was going out and trying to find money. And here's what I learned in trying to go after a decent amount of money to make a movie. If you have named actors... The money comes. Yeah. To get the named actors, they want to know that you got the money. Right. So there's that quandary of <laughs> Well, we got it. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have this? Yeah. And oh, I mean, we stalled for a year. Not stalled. I mean, we were out there all the time. Stalled with the actor or stalled just, with the just making the movie. Both. Like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. getting everything to come together. And we're yeah. all obviously working our other jobs. Um and uh so it was just kind of going on all these meetings that were leading to nowhere because they want to know who's attached what yeah. actors you got attached and uh so and so obviously uh dakota johnson and shia labeouf are in the uh yeah we in the movie but i mean they, they was there anyone were, else attached or how did you get them attached i mean the um one of the other producers these guys were sliding up into dms Hey, I've got this movie. I want you to be in this movie. Wait, and like you're saying on a just Facebook in, thing Instagram, or something? Just in yeah, Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, they slid up into an actor. I'm not going to name names. Yeah. Who was like, "Yeah, I'll do it." And we're like, "Oh, what? We got a yes from a big actor." Yeah. Like, loved the concept, loved everything, um, and just said, "Hey, just so you know, if something else comes along, you know how right. this is how it goes." Blah blah. blah. Um, we're like, cool, and then went. And started going to back to money, going, hey, we got so and so, and then money was starting to go. Oh, okay, cool. So then, like all this stuff goes around. Then we had another actor come on board. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up, you know, getting, you know, in the millions of dollars, we were starting to attach money to be able to go out and do this. Um, then a big Marvel movie cast, and we lost our first guy, oh. who's you know plays in one of those movies um and wow. then and then uh, the guy that play was set on board to play um tyler um was someone that was you know really good 
um, backed out about six months before, five months before we were ready to make the movie. We you already had the money. We yeah. had the money at that point. Um, Dakota wasn't on at that point. Everything kind of came together fast. We knew we had a window to shoot uh, in the summer. Um, this actor dropped out um, because his wife was pregnant and was delivering right when we were supposed to do that. It was his first kid. And he was like, yeah, hey. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, we get it. Um, and all of a sudden, we had a short list of people, and Shia LaBeouf's name was on there. Um, he, and he was interested? or No, or the director he, said, who they hey, wanted. who are we going after? We yeah, lost yeah. this. We've got money interested, but it's always tied to names. And um, they said, Shia's our number one. Um, so mm -hmm. um, we had uh, brought some of the uh, producers on um, that had done Little Miss Sunshine. Yeah. Um, Ron Yerksa, um, and these guys. So they were reaching out to actors, unknown producers in the in the higher up feature world. You know, me reaching out, they're not going to be like, oh yeah, let's get right back to you. You know, <laughs> right, right. But Albert and Ron, these guys had had history and and went back to uh, those guys with another producer, Lige, who was kind of helping make these calls, and uh, she, you know, got it to Shia. Now Shia, who obviously is an artist in all fashions, was getting ready, and I'm probably going to screw this up, was getting ready to go do an art exhibit where he was going into a hut somewhere for a month, and there was a phone line in there right. that was tied to a museum somewhere that if you picked the phone up, it would ring Shia in this hut, ha! and he would answer, and you could just have a conversation with him. So that's what you did? You went to this well, museum? Uh, no, 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 we didn't. That's oh. actually a better part. We did. No, we yeah, didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we got wind. They were like, call Shia. He's about to go into this place. Okay, yeah. He'd, um, what I later found out was he had watched the proof of concept and was like, is Zach in? And the, his people were like, yeah, as far as we know. He's like, if Zach's in, I'll do it. And then he talked to the directors for like 30, 45 minutes, and then he went into this thing, and he was basically out of touch for a month. Um, but his window was two months sooner than this other actor. And yeah. so all of a sudden... We didn't have actors, but now all of a sudden we got Shia, and then everything kind of you know went uh, fast forward. Um, Dakota ended up signing on, John Hawks, um, Bruce Dern, you yeah. know who had worked with the guys that did Little Miss Sunshine on a couple of films. They had done yep. Nebraska and stuff, um, and so the cast just started growing. Um, money solid up, you know, solidified and firmed up, and all of a sudden we were in Savannah. You know, about six weeks a, ahead of Hell yeah. schedule. I, I had one more shoot um, in my other job. Um, I had to go to Israel and do a, an interview um, with Netanyahu. So I came back from that and then um, went straight to Savannah. You know, they had housing set up and they, those guys had gotten there a little bit earlier. Um, Zach showed up probably three or four weeks before. Um, Shai showed up early and, you know, he plays a crab fisherman. So he was getting up at like four in the morning, and going out it. crab fishing, and then coming back at like nine thirty or ten, and hanging out with Zach and getting to know Zach. Nice. Um, and then Thomas Hayden Church, you know, came yeah. on. I um, mean, it just really, it was just really a family oriented, you know, deal out there. So what was like the time frame from when you, let's say, right when you got back from shooting Proof of Concept to when you're in Savannah? Two Stop. years. Two years, okay. And it's like, for me, it felt like a super long time. I felt at times like we weren't going to get it. We weren't going to make it. You know, yeah, you go through yeah, all those ups yeah, and downs. yeah. And then, you you know, I've since talked to other people, and they're like, dude, we've had this script for 14 years, and we're just now <laughs> making it. So I'm <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I better what, shut Terry up. Terry Gilliam made, finally got that movie done after like 30 <laughs> the years. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, Man yeah, from yeah. La Macho or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it's crazy because two years is quick, but also for people that aren't filmmakers that don't know out there, it's like yeah, yeah, like two years of constantly like searching for money, and, figuring this out, yeah. yeah, and 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 like you said, the ups and downs of not knowing whether it's ever going to happen, and then finally getting to that, like, what is that feeling like when you get to the Savannah and you're like, hell yeah, we're here, we're we're doing it. To get to Savannah, and you know, it was, it was surreal, and you know, we do all this stuff, and then it's like. 
we went out and shot this proof of concept with three of us and, and four of us really. <laughs> yeah. And we get to set and all of a sudden we've got a, a building rented that's our production office and you got you know, trucks pulling up with gear, and trucks yeah. and you know, Melissa from wardrobe, you know, it's like all these people are starting to show up and we kinda look at each other like Holy Damn. shit! This is happening. It's like a real movie right they, now. They they, yeah. they 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 gave us a check. Yeah, you know, it's like they're allowing us to make this movie. Yeah, um, and That's awesome. it, it felt it felt really good. Um, and it was a tight schedule. You know, it's um, we ended up shooting just over thirty thirty one days, I think. Um, over the we we shot five day weeks. Um, it was hot out there. We shot in the middle of the summer. We started in June and ended like middle of July, maybe I think we started June around June 12th and went kind of till the end of July. Um, okay. So like six weeks, you, it was like, yeah, five, six weeks out there is about 31 yeah. days of, of shooting, you know, 4th of July was in there and, um, but it was good. I mean, you know, people are always like, well, what's it like working, you know, with someone like Zach? And it was just like, it was phenomenal. We went out to do the proof of concept and I, I walked on to, um, this little house that we we're staying at. And then Zach came, and I met him for the first time. He's got a big smile, um, but he kind of had a a stutter. He was trying to get stuff out, you know. Was just like, oh, excited okay. or yeah. yeah, he was, yeah. I think he was just excited. And, yeah. I mean, this is big. This is big for anyone. Yeah. And uh, we sat down after the first day of shooting, and uh, I was like, all right, this is gonna this is gonna work. And Zach disappeared. And I was like, where's Zach? Because we were in there editing and having fun looking at the footage. And yeah. he comes back a couple hours later. And he's got the script open. I think he had a pencil behind his ear. He's like, guys, can I talk to you? And we're like, yeah, yeah, what do you want? And he sits down. He's like, I have some questions about my character. And I was just, my character. He was like, he was giving notes. Yeah, he was in it. And yeah. I was just like, oh, man, this is going to be fun. Yeah. This, this, yeah, this is awesome. That he, he's yeah, a professional. He's, he, and he's that, yeah, that vested in what, what's he happening. Was, he was just all about it. And, you know, probably the first 30% of the movies in Tidy Whities. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and it's yeah. just like. Yeah. You know, he just is like he's fearless. Whatever, yeah. whatever yeah. we need to do, <laughs> yeah. let's do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Soaping himself up to fall through the windows, and you know, Zach did majority a lot of his own, you know, stuff. That's him coming out the window when you see, you know, and yeah, um, it was just it was an amazing experience. Okay, and so is it's Tyler and Mike are yep. the directors. Tyler and Nelson and Michael Schwartz. Michael Schwartz. Yeah. Okay, and they're buddies, or yeah, they've known each other for probably. I want to say eight or nine years now. And you said Michael is an editor. Michael was an editor, a commercial editor. Okay, did and, a lot of and Tyler, and stuff. actor, writer. And... Tyler is an actor, you know, a, a writer, and he'll probably shoot me for saying this, but he's done a lot of hand modeling. Oh well, we used to, <laughs> we used to be. I'd be sitting here, and the TV would come on. He's like, "Hey, Dave, that's my hand on the computer, <laughs> handing it over." <laughs> That's my hand in like the Taco George Bell commercial. Costanza, yeah, yeah, it was totally. You know, I, I, <laughs> like think, said, <laughs> I think he's still in my phone as Tyler Hand Model because I thought it was the oh, funniest thing. Yeah, it's got to be. Um, <laughs> but he's got a great sense of humor, and and you know he's and he and he's the he's main dude in in the Moped Diaries. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, he does a great job in that. Yeah, in our um, proof of concept, it's him and Zach. Okay, um, acting off each other, and and the idea was to go with someone who has the name because money money yeah, yeah. tyler's a great actor and did a yeah. great job in that um and yeah it just we all knew to make the movie we wanted to make right right we want to shoot for the stars yeah we didn't go we want this person we were always up here yeah right you know, right, let, right let's let's shoot for the stars because this script deserves it yeah and that's that's incredible i mean i mean the trailer is amazing it's fun to watch uh somebody i was telling you somebody had like a little scene that was out there because i was trying to look it up um maybe a few weeks back and before the trailer was out and i saw like just this little scene and i was like damn there's just this scene makes me want to see this movie and then uh watching the trailer it's i mean it's like right up my alley i, I like i you know not to you know, I'll give credit where credit's due. The Marvel movies are great and all those big, big explosions and all that stuff in those movies. It's not really my style of a movie where this is actually my style of a movie. Like, I love story-driven movies, you know? I always said, and Mike and I would always talk about this, and then Mike Tyler and I would always say, I for me, I wanted to make my standby, uh, standby me film. Yeah. Because it's like, I, I graduated high school in 1990, and, and that coming-of-age film, like a standby me... Um, you know, a lot of those 90s 
you know, 80s, 90s films, the ETs. That, yeah. It was just like, I just wanted to feel. Um, right. And nothing against the Marvel movies, because obviously they're phenomenal and do what they do. Um, but I also feel right now people are looking for absolutely something like this. Um, Because I I think that a lot, too, because, I mean, uh, I'm slightly younger than you, like eight years, but um, but I basically grew up like 80s movies, 90s movies, and just those like epic kind of, you know, uh, movies that it was like it, 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 it like ranges through all emotions and goes through this huge story arc and and it's fun to watch that and i miss that big time i mean john hughes is like the dude that it's like come on like that doesn't exist right now and 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 there's a big you know hole i think in 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 in, in, you know because of that but a movie like this like i mean i've you know i think there's comparing it sort of to like a modern day tom sawyer sort of feel yeah because it does have that feel like you know they're they're on this mission. They're on a know. journey. Yeah. And there's a raft involved. Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically what happens is um, Zach's character runs away from the group home because he wants to become a professional wrestler. He runs into Shia's character, Tyler, um, who's running for his own reasons. And after a little bit of deliberate uh, deliberation, Tyler agrees to take him to drop him off at this wrestling school. So we've got a 50, 60, uh, 70 mile journey of, you know, I kind of say planes, trains, and automobiles, but they're staying off the beaten yeah. path and then they're making this raft to part of their journey is to float down. And then um, Dakota Johnson's character is from the, the group home and is trying to find Zach to, to bring him back and make sure. That okay. So she, so she works there. I had seen that in the trailer where yeah. I was, I was like, okay, so she was, I mean, cause she, she's kind of not the like, and you know, not that the anti, but, but she like, she's the sort of the pain in the butt in the beginning is what you see. Yeah. And then, and then she, does she kind of says, so yeah, I mean, without giving too much away, yeah. she, yeah, I saw that I think into, in the trailer she sort of seemed like pulled she, into the, pulled into their adventure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which yeah. is really cool. Yeah. You know? And then it's like, cause that's really heartwarming to, to feel like you're backing this up. Like this person has this dream and you're like, instead of, you know, obviously you start off with the idea of I have to do my job and get you back there. Yeah. And then you kind of get, into yeah. the the whole emotion of you know what let's let's chase that dream yeah. you know yeah and we ended up shooting in Georgia and in, in, in and around Savannah and um, you know brought a, a really great DP in a director of photography by the name of Nigel Block um, who's done True Detectives and you know worked on uh, Lord of the Rings you know stuff wow um, so it's like we were blessed um, money obviously wants to know they're going to be completed. That's yeah. going to be done well. They're working with first-time directors, so they brought in an experienced DP who could help harness these guys um, and, and get their vision into the thing. Yeah, and, and, I, and I wonder, like, um, you know, it, it's really cool that you're able to get that trust from money in terms of, like, being first-time directors. Like, obviously, they, I mean, they had the moped diaries, like, under their yeah. belt, but, like it's saying hey you made a short mo- short film and now we're just going to give you millions of dollars to go make this right like that's pretty you know i mean that's kind of taking a risk on their part yeah. and uh and and so you were saying like like is that so you reassure them kind of by filling in the yeah. gaps and they they say give us an experienced dp that can help uh with these directors you know just give you surround them with an experienced team right grips gaff electric you know experience team so that it's the highest rate for success right and um well, that's pretty awesome that, that they're willing to take that that gamble in a sort in a sense the script's you, that good yeah you know? and that's what i mean i mean like uh and and tyler and tyler mike and michael wrote it, wrote it. yeah yeah the yeah. writer director team yeah and so i mean so i guess that that kind of reassures you if your money going well they wrote this thing yeah. they have this vision yeah so that i'm sure they'll be able to execute it and then if you put that you know the the and production crew around them and i think um the idea of doing the proof of concept really really benefited um us um because it turned out really well yeah and it's like i got a credit you know in michael's editing and and, and we went out there and we just had time you know yeah. we could we could just kind of really do it, you know. We, we didn't shoot that much footage, but yeah. we just took our time to find a good location. Tyler has got a really great um, 
artistic eye. Like he he lived he, he grew he wants, up in this yeah. area yeah and it's like I want this house that's this I want to drive when I want him to run out here, um, and so it was really it was really fun to work with the both of them yeah the most fun I had was on the boat chase scene because we just had one of their friends driving a boat and yeah. it's me standing on the front and Michael holding onto my vest to do this shot that actually two of the shots made it into the movie that we shot from the proof of concept oh wow that it's the raft out in the middle of the ocean. Um, that we had shot and it came kind of far back and then we had done a 360 but there's a couple of shots that snuck into the movie yeah a, f- a, f- a fork in the um the water shot we ended up using it said a good symbolism and we couldn't find that where we were in yeah Spanish. i mean that's really cool and 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 just to know that you can make something so i mean obviously you have the talent from all the years of of being a cinematographer yourself and a director and and producing other things but just thinking in this day and age like you know you could take an f-55 with some some prime some size primes and and uh inspire and going out and like making this like i mean what looks like a movie you know and i mean that's pretty it's pretty incredible thinking you know coming coming up when i did with like you know the VX one thousand VX two thousand skateboard that was uh, my cameras first camera yeah, yeah and then you know and then to where it's at at this point uh, consumer wise yeah. you know not not like I mean obviously you run uh, you know you have a rental house and you have all this gear and you do all these you know you, on a real professional level but but at the same time any old person can go get an f-55 you know whatever you can you know. go get a black magic uh, yeah you know a camera that you know uh, it doesn't even have to be a, it's just a small camera it, right now is such a cool time um i stopped back at my high school here in the last summer country day there in cincinnati a, a couple of years ago it was last year it was probably we had just finished film shooting the film so two years ago yeah and um was going through these classes and seeing these kids making these short films and they're really good. Yeah. And I was like, holy cow, if I had this in high school, how much further along? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I took a detour. I came out of high school and opened a bicycle snowboard skate shop. And yeah. And did that for 10 years before I even started holding a camera. And then I had sold a convertible car that I'd built and uh, bought a VX1000 to go shoot <laughs> a bike dock on John Stamstead. Damn. Setting the world record riding along the Continental Divide. And so you have this whole other life long before. It's so funny. I got a whole other life that you know i look back i'm 47 now and it seems like a whole nother life yeah you know so it's funny that our paths never crossed yeah even yeah, with yeah like the jeff termains and the trip you know and the fantasy factory fantasy stuff factory doing, yeah. i directed fantasy factory for like 14 or 15 episodes and um you know it's like we just met like through kaplan, kaplan right yeah yeah through dave kaplan one of the guys that we work with um you know but yeah it's funny it's like so wait so you so go into that a little bit about your life in the in the uh, bicycle world yeah so in during high school um i raced road bikes so 10 speed so you actually raced and i worked at a pro shop uh, yeah in high school and i I became a a pro mechanic um at a young age i'm six foot six and you know my brother uh worked at the store and might not have told the owner that i was only like 13 when i started working there yeah, and so I started working in the shop because you were that young. tall. I was that tall, <laughs> yeah. and I was just like whatever. And I loved to tinker, and I'd been working on bikes at home. Um, and so I went into this bike shop and worked at this great bike shop called Solo Sports for probably three years. And uh, so when I graduated high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and at one point, my mom ran a daycare out of our house, and she broke her ankle. Um, and really bad taking some diapers to the trash and it was ice like black Damn. ice oh, yeah, and she yeah. had slipped in her foot and it Damn. blew up and so she was in a wheelchair so i ended up helping out with the daycare with her and ended up going well what am i gonna do to make money and i started a, a mobile bike repair business called going mobile okay so i'd go to people's homes and repair bikes because friends were always calling me up like hey can you fix my bike and i was like okay so the living yeah. room, the living room of this house became a bike shop um <laughs> and i had this car with your mom's Yakima spot rack in my mom's yeah, spot yeah, yeah yeah and i had this big uh box yakima box on the top and had tubes tires you know had like yeah. stuff and i would know what bike i was going to see so i could like put some stuff there and yeah you know started that bike shop and then it got to the point where i couldn't be everywhere 
So I opened a little 200 square foot shop. I mean, not much bigger than this. Yeah. Every day I'd have to bring the bike repairs in and out. Um, and then I moved to an 800 square. That shop was down behind a building. So you had to go into a parking lot and down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, hidden where no one hidden. was. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was another one in Hyde Park Square that used to be an outdoor store when I was in high school. And I went to look at it and the, the place was gone. And I went down and uh, met the owners who um, I'm still friends with to today, the Robinsons, and rented the space down there and had a bike shop down there for a couple of years. Damn. And then ended up with a 4,000 square foot shop and we became the Burton uh, snowboard dealer and um, oh, wow. Santa Cruz mountain bikes and um, KHS bikes and just a lot of bikes. We had skateboards in there. Um, it was funny. When we brought Santa Cruz bikes and Rob Roskop was the mountain oh, bike yeah. rep. Oh, yeah. So classic. When I, you know, I remember he had that those classic decks, the artwork. Yeah, was so yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Rob was our in-house sales uh sales rep for santa cruz mountain bikes so yeah i did the i did the bike stuff and i became a pro mechanic again for a guy that was named john stamstead i was with him for probably two or three years but he's an endurance mountain biker so a 24-hour specialist you know these these running races Damn. and these bike races that are all fun where you get a team of people to go out and there's four of you you're gonna ride for 24 hours you do an hour hour and a half loop well he entered one time um and he, ta he called the owner and said he wanted to do it by himself. And the guy's like, no, you can't do that. You need four people. So he literally wrote his name four different ways <laughs> yeah. and entered and just did it by himself and created this whole endurance That's mountain crazy. biking. Yeah, it yeah. was. So then basically we do these 24-hour races. And one time we were at a... So uh, he rode for 24, 24 hours. hours. I would see... We traveled, <laughs> with, we traveled with two bikes and I would see him every lap, which depending on where we were is a 50-minute to a two-hour, yeah. depending on the weather. Uh, lap and I would trade bikes out with him, and then I kind of became a nutritionist list with him, and a sometimes a psychologist. You know, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. these guys are just um, they it was just hammered to to be able to what they do. So I would get food ready for the next lap, fix anything that was broke on the bikes, um, and then we were up at a race in I think Canmore, Canada, or somewhere, and he was like. I think I want to set the world record for this new bike trail that went from Canada to Mexico along the Continental Divide. Damn. Uh, it's called the Great Divide Trail or something like that. I can't remember. Um, but it was 2,465 miles, and it was finally all connected. <laughs> and there was this company made these maps that you could do. Um, and I was like, oh, that'd be fun. He goes, yeah, and it's unsupported, just meaning he didn't need a mechanic. And John was a good mechanic in his own right. Yeah. And I was like, okay, but I want to film it. Yeah, I'd oh, never filmed shit. anything. There I'd never go. held a camera. So I yeah. sold the car, bought a VX1000, bought two plane tickets, bought 50 hours of tape and like four batteries. Didn't know what the hell I was doing. Called up a buddy of mine out here that was a play, it was a medic on sets, Chris Carrington, and said, "Hey dude, do you know how to direct?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "I got this idea." He's like, "Cool, let's do it." Yeah. So, we started up at uh, you know, Canada and like I I didn't know what f-stop was i didn't know right. the fact that anything worked out and that we even have a film <laughs> yeah that's yeah. completed after a couple of years is amazing knowing yeah. what i know now so oh so that is that documentary is out there somewhere like or, or, you know what I, it's not out but um i get hit up a few times a year for it yeah and now in this day and age it's on digi beta yeah and chris just pulled it out i talked to him like three weeks ago and he's like, go find a place we can digitize. So I'm going to put it out finally. Oh, hell yeah. Um, but the crazy thing was we did the project, um, and this is back when you needed hundreds of thousands of dollars to edit. You yeah, couldn't yeah, do yeah. it on a laptop you know, right. like it is now. And we finally uh, found a company that came on board to help us edit it. And uh, they ended up, um, we shot all this footage for three weeks, and we got contacted right before we went out by Nat Geo. Oh, they wow. They were doing a project. A guy was riding a camel across a desert to mimic a ride that was done 200, 300 years ago or something. Okay. And so they they heard about the John's ride and wanted to do two offsetting things. So they're like, we're going to send someone out with you. And we're like, no, we're not. Yeah. You know, this is this is our film. We're doing know, blah, this. Blah, blah. And so they're like, well, we'll license footage from you when it's all said and done. And I was like, okay. And I want to say we got something stupid like $800. Yeah, from yeah, Nat Geo yeah, yeah, to license yeah, yeah. again knowing what I know now we <laughs> shot your whole half your show yeah um, yeah but it was a great experience and it's like if I go back and look at that footage now which we have somewhere the first day is like all just wides oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bike yeah. Or by. 
And then literally Chris and I were talking and I said, because we knew Nat Geo was interested, I'm like, what would Nat Geo do? And we started thinking they have those cool POVs that are maybe an animal or whatever. So I started wading out into the creek on a bridge going by and would put the camera way low and see him go by. I was hanging out of the car on his feet and started to realize that B-roll, those secondary shots you need to make a pic. Yeah. I wasn't taught it. It just, I was like, this is a cool shot. Yeah. This is a cool shot. Doing an interview while I'm driving on the road to John while he's climbing a hill. And, yeah. you know, it just kind of um, forced my eye to go, wide shots are boring except when you use them to set up a scene or to, to do know whatever. where you're at yeah started climbing trees and shooting them going over damn that's awesome how it just kind of like like uh you know i hate the word but organically sort of yeah. happened yeah and then you just started becoming this filmmaker yeah because you were like oh i can't be a mechanic this time yeah. i guess i, I need just, to let's go do it find a way to be there and then that's to have a camera yeah i mean that's that's amazing that that's what started your journey into this side of the yeah and then i went world. back to cincinnati chris had the footage out here um, and started doing like music videos because now I had a camera. Started yeah. doing music videos for local bands. Noah Hunt, who's the lead singer for Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and you know we just started doing all the stuff in uh, Bootsy Collins. We'd done some stuff with Freak Bass, and um, just started doing all this fun stuff back there. And ninety eight degrees is from Cincinnati. Oh yeah, the the um, the boy. I'll say boy band, but they're not a boy band. They they had put themselves together. Yeah. Um. Um, with, with uh, Nick Lachey. Nick Lachey yeah, yeah, yeah. and Drew Lachey and mm-hmm. uh, Jeff Timmons. And, uh, um, so they're from where you're at. And they're so- from Cincinnati. Disney came to do a special there. Yeah. Um, outdoor concert. Um, and a friend called me up knowing that I was interested in seeing how bigger productions were done. And she was like, hey, I'm looking for production assistance. You know, PA is the, low, the lowest on the set, but you're in the middle of everything. And she goes, "Do you want to, you want you want to work on this?" And I was like, "Yeah, but I have a request." And she's like, "What?" And I was like, "If the director or whoever's coming to do this needs a PA assigned to him, that's the job that I want." Right. And she's like, "Yeah, that's fine." It was a guy named Jeb Bryan, um, who had done a ton of uh, concert, you know, videos and you know for Sony, um, and ended up, you know, working on that stuff. You know, you never you don't meet the band really right you know it's like whatever and and i was just driving this director around and he was super funny um and he was like at that point i directed i think i just directed a music video for charlie daniels and yeah. i shot it on serial number one of the varicam oh uh, yeah a guy by the name of mike caporell in cincinnati was doing work with uh, panasonic and got that so there was an article done up on tv technology where it was a photo of um charlie myself and Mike that said old technology meets new technology oh, and we yeah. uh, did a song a music video for a song called In America um, so I had that music video to show that director because you know you, you're driving around for five days like what, yeah, are, you yeah. doing? what are you doing what do you want to do um, and he at one point watched it and was like yeah hey, it was good you know I mean it was a little kid running around with a yeah. you know camera and um, it was right after we shot it probably two or three weeks right after 9-11 you know, that's how okay. far we're going back. But um, in America, you know, Charlie had, re- you know, had a had a point in that song, had a message. Um, and so it was cool. You know, did that. Yeah. And then um, about five or six weeks later, I get a call uh, from Gloria Medell, Jeb's assistant, saying, hey, um, Jeb wants to know if you want to go to Japan and shoot nice. write edit direct do everything with me on the behind the scenes on the live of Budokan for Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> and I was like yeah that hell sounds, yeah that sounds good yeah um, and then I was like oh man my VX 1000s all beat up <laughs> so I talked to my uncle and borrowed some money from uh, from family and bought a PD-150 yeah and I remember those it came in like yeah. two days before I left so I had to learn how to use the camera and I had bought a wireless mic. I had one wireless mic and would just run that in there yeah. and went over and for, I don't know, 13 or 14 days was with Ozzy and family. Oh, nice. And shot basically an episode of the Osbournes before the Osbournes came out. Yeah. Um, the record label said, this is what we want to see. But we were going out and doing uh, 
they were just sightseeing. You know, they played three concerts. But yeah, um, but it was that chemistry between oh the family. God, it was so funny. There's, <laughs> and you know, I was new to the little clique of people. Yeah. And so Ozzy just wanted to talk, and I realized how incredibly uh, brilliant he is. Um, yeah. And he's just smart. He loves history. He loves his channel. So we got talking about a lot of stuff. And there's one time we were in Kyoto, Japan, and there was these steps coming down. And there might have been, if there was 80 steps, there were 500. Yeah. And all beautiful, like roughed up. And at the bottom, on the last step, there was half, you know, hewn. there was this guy that was probably 80 years old. And he's just roughing up the stone that had been laid. And I've got a picture. The video is from behind Jack and Ozzy. And without missing a beat, Ozzy just looks down and goes, he was 10 when he started that. And just turns and walks <laughs> and just turns and exits frame. <laughs> and I'm laughing and Jack turns and looks at the camera and's laughing because it was just so funny. These steps come yeah, all the yeah. way down. This old guy <laughs> just all hunched over and hands just beat up. <laughs> yeah, that is brilliant. And yeah. it was just the funniest funny. thing. Yeah. So we edited that and then I ended up getting a... A show came to Cincinnati um, called The Mansion that was a reality show for TBS. <clears throat> and they lost a camera operator at the last minute. And they were like, uh, my sister was working on it. And she knew there was a camera operator, obviously, and said, hey, my brother could pot potentially do it. Yeah. Um, and I had never held a big camera at that point. Oh, right. I just held. Yeah, you know, you're just doing these 1000. little. Yeah. Well, I go there and it's this brand new Sony XD cam. And they had sent this guy named Mike DeRoach out because these cameras had never been. I think they were shooting another show simultaneously, but these cameras were just coming out. It was a disc-based camera, no yeah. more tape. Um, and so we had, he was on set the other day just to can answer questions. And it's funny because I've remained <laughs> friends with him. And I told him years later, I'd never held a big camera. Yeah. This is that fake it until you make it technology. Oh, hell yeah. And I probably asked him so many questions. He kept saying, yeah, dude, it, it's like the beta camera. It's not that much different. And in my head, I'm going, I've never I seen a beta camera. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of those like, questions. Cool, exactly like the yeah. beta, huh? <laughs> so if you were going to have to white balance something, then is it in the same spot? Yeah. 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 Where was that again? <laughs> you know, it's like stupid questions yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, that yeah. In a matter of two days, I got up to speed. And the thing I learned quickly is a 30 some odd pound camera versus a little five pound camera is two different things on your back oh yeah for sure and it took me about three days i kept I, i'd go home the first night and second night going i don't think i can do this yeah You're like, i'm gonna get in an ice bath just, yeah, yeah, yeah. i just was a wreck and it was like you know you shoot for 11 hours that's a lot of handheld yeah running around but yeah. your body gets used to it and you kind of go but i'm 47 now and six seven eight years ago i said i'm a director now yeah, direct yeah, DP. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want to hold that camera anymore. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's not fun. So at least for my guys, <laughs> they know that I'm used to holding the camera. And any chance I can go take a knee, or we're shooting this on sticks. Yeah, my style is sticks. I like yeah. stuff. Loose to head. Look good. Right? Yeah, loose head. If you want to have that, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like all those tricks that they say in reality. It's like when you shoot like soft scripted and stuff. They're always like, "Well, just give it a little bit of motion." It's like, how about we just shoot a really nice looking show and right. let's just have fun. Yeah. You know, and the Hills came along and was like, hey, let's shoot it like we shoot movies. Right. Let's make it look really nice. And then let's just, give it good they'll sound. just kind of have no script and go for yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy kind of evolution how that happens. And all of a sudden you're, you're in Japan or whatever with, with Ozzy. Ozzy. And, and then, uh, so then fast forward to you're out in LA. And, I shot that show in Cincy. Yeah. And the, sh the, the show ended and the production manager Rita Dumar was like you should come to LA you've got a lot of work and I was like oh okay and I was getting married yeah and I got married moved to LA and she got me on a show right out of the bat but no one knew me as a camera operator but I had done work with Panasonic on the DBX 100 through Mike Caparell in Cincinnati yeah. his connection with Jan Crittenden so like my first DVX didn't even have a serial number on it yeah. And we were just like doing tests and putting it through its paces. That show was being shot on the DVX, so they made me the tech manager. And then they allowed me to to uh, operate Steadicam because I had done Steadicam stuff at that point. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was always funny that they allowed me to shoot Steadicam, but you're only getting the rate for the tech. Yeah, you know? yeah. They had to figure out a way not to yeah. pay you. But I'm yeah. still <laughs> I'm still friends with all those guys. And that was uh, exec produced by George Fashore, who kind of had created. When he was at Buna Murray or working with Buna Murray, um, reality TV with the real world. 
Yeah. Like they came up with that concept of throw people in the house, go from there. Um, and created a great friendship with George and ended up shooting Jamie Kennedy's Blowing Up for MTV and The yeah. Rock Life and like all these shows with George. It's like, I got to take my hat off to George. He helped me out a lot. Saw me as a DP, you know, yeah. and, and gave me that opportunity out here that on paper allowed me to go, you know, other places and, and you know, do that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I did a lot of reality and then started doing scripted because I wanted to, you know, be able to do that. When I first moved here, people would say, "What are you?" I was like, "Well, I'm a kind of a producer, an editor, a director." Because I was doing work back in Cincinnati for like Procter and Gamble and Cintas. Yeah. I was doing corporate work and making good money. I was just bored. Right. You know, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. like I, I enjoyed the clients that I worked with, but I just wanted to do something different. And then probably spent a good five, six years traveling, shooting shows. Discovery Channel type shows. I did Richard Hammond's Crash Course a couple seasons for BBC, um, Fantasy Factory, The Rock Life, and you know, uh, just did all these fun shows traveling. Yeah. So how how did you get in the mix with Tremaine and Fantasy Factory? So Fantasy Factory. So I met Tremaine through. I'd done a piece. Um, I'm trying to think of how it worked. There's a company called Soul Pancake that does really really nice videos on the web that I helped them do their first show for MTV was hired um, and the guy that was running that was front uh, friends with trip yeah um, okay and then um, somehow they were like how have you not met Tremaine and my buddy um, who builds all of Travis Pastrana's ramps um, Nate Wessel was like, I know Nate you yeah know Nate yeah yeah so Nate and I've known each other for a long time and so he kind of connected me, and he was like, dude, like, how are you guys not together? And then um, I had created this TV show about this family, uh, the Cabanas family down in Key West, Florida. The dad was a uh, air show pilot, and they ran a ride ride share business down there for biplanes. Mm-hmm. And this guy was just a pistol, and his, you know, his kid, they were just a funny family. And so I went down and shot a proof of concept again. This is how we, this is how we sell shows. This is how I knew for the Peanut Butter Falcon. Yeah. You know, this is what helps sell shows. I took it into production companies, and they all wanted it. It was a good... This guy was a great character. And I got set up a meeting with uh, Tremaine, and he was like, oh, dude, this is awesome. You know? Yeah. It wasn't in the vein of all his shows, but it kind of was, because this guy was a character, like yeah. all you guys on, you know, the Jackass, the, you know, um, Nitro Circus type stuff. He was just an older pilot, air show pilot, and, yeah. you know, had a storied past. And... um then a year and a half later, we didn't sell the show, um, and sadly, Fred died in a plane crash right as we had kind of come to a deal where we were going to get it oh, to go damn. make the show. Like, we found out on a Thursday, um, or one day, and then Fred passed away the next day. Um, but he was going to uh, to do air shows for three weeks in the South, um, South America, and I talked to him and said, hey, we've got someone interested when you come back, we'll sit down and let's get this figured out. And he, I remember him saying, he's like, well, you should be coming down with me. This is going to be a good time. An accident happened, you know, and not not necessarily his fault, and you know, didn't make it. Um, yeah. But that show, Tremaine saw it, and then uh, Jen O'Connor, uh, who was working at Rob Deerdick's company, I had done a show with, and she said, "Hey, we need a director for Fantasy Factory season six. and I was like, "Oh, okay, cool." And so she got me in there. So they set up a meeting with Tremaine, Shane you know, all the people, yeah. you know, down there. And I come walking in and Tremaine goes, oh, wait, this is the guy we're talking about? Oh, dude, we're good. Let's move on. Yeah. Hey, Dave, I didn't know. They were ba- they were butchering your name. My assistant wasn't telling me exactly yeah, who. Well, if yeah. I would have known it was you, because I didn't really know that he was going to yeah. be in the. I didn't know who was going to be in the yeah. meeting. So then, you know, I sat down and they were like, oh, let's just, let's talk about what we're doing on the show. Tremaine was cool and was like, this guy's good. Yeah. You know, let's just yeah. let's just go. Like now that you're he here, let's it. just start talking yeah. about working on it. Yeah. yeah. And Rob was in there and stuff. So So that so that plane show concept, like were you already involved with being a pilot and owning because I mean you have my planes step- over like we're not too far from the airport yeah. right now. My stepdad flew B seventeens. Okay. And so I started flying when I started the bike shop, which was right out of high school, and soloed at about eight hours and ended up not finishing my license, um, and 
I had soloed and that night went and watched Memphis Bell with my stepdad. Um, so I've always been around planes and, and had yeah. that. And then about eight or nine years ago, um, I kind of got back into planes. And yeah. a girl that I dated, who I'm really, really good friends with now, Carrie, uh, was a flight instructor. And yeah. we bought a plane and started just renting out the little 172. And then um, she had a twin engine that, you know, we ended up getting in refurbishing. And, you know, so yeah. I kind of got into planes where I had a, a little side business just renting planes. Because basically I was like, when I buy something for me, it needs to pay for itself. Yeah. You know, I've got the rental business yeah, for the yeah, cameras yeah. and stuff. And um, if I buy anything, it just needs to pay for itself. Very rarely do I buy something. Like, I've got a lot of toys that people might see, but they're all making money. Right. They're so all I've got assets. You know, so we've, yeah. yeah, we've got the planes and the planes rent. As soon as something doesn't necessarily pay for itself, then it's time to sell it. Yeah. And planes aren't cheap. Um, and I've been lucky enough, knock on wood, that the last seven years they've rented enough to at least break even yeah. so if i have the option to have them to go somewhere if i need to for right. work they're there um you know i don't fly as much anymore yeah um we just sold the twin engine um life just kinds of kind of yeah moves along yeah for sure man it's crazy like i mean i guess you know like because the word entrepreneur is just definitely applies here because just the idea of having like bicycle tubes in your mom's living room and then how many different directions your businesses have gone and and how much yeah. you have going on and and uh i mean it's really really neat to uh yeah to kind of follow along with all of that but um but yeah man i uh i i love hearing about everything and i'm super excited about the peanut butter falcon i'm hoping that i'm gonna get a uh, screening of it here in this yeah we can in the uh, yeah, we can do it <laughs> yeah because we we're sitting right now in your uh in your movie theater in your house yeah and uh and that's pretty neat man there's an awesome screen right up here and, we got and 150 uh, inches right there we can, yeah we can definitely do a screening for i can fit nine people yeah nine people in here <laughs> and <laughs> nine of our best buds yeah. nine of our best buds come, come over this weekend come watch it. it yeah yeah dude We've got, candy We've yeah had, uh, i know there's a popcorn, popcorn machine, machine over there yeah that uh, popcorn no it's been there a while yeah yeah <laughs> no, it's pretty neat man and, I, and i'm psyched for you and, and excited for for what's to come with uh with that movie and then for what's to come in the future with other projects yeah, i'm excited let's continue yeah i'm gonna uh i'm gonna i'm gonna put the uh trailer at the end of of the podcast so people can check out the the trailer for the peanut butter falcon perfect uh starring shia labeouf and uh and dakota johnson zach godsaken zach godsaken and then directed by michael uh schwartz and tyler nilson yeah produced by armory films which is uh chris mamol and tim yeah, and yourself, you're, you're involved. Yeah, myself, it's, Elijah, yeah. uh, Ron, and Albert producing. Yeah, um, and it's the the film's got a bunch of great uh, music in it, um, and we just landed an amazing cast. Yeah, you know? and, and, yeah, I'm excited for it. So it, it took the uh, audience award at South by Southwest is where we premiered. Yeah, we won the audience award there, so we ended up with five screenings there. Um, and then this past weekend, it was in Nantucket's Film Festival and won the audience award there. So we had, yeah. I think, three screenings there. So it's, yeah, I mean, I, like you said, it, it's, I think a lot of people are looking for a good hearted movie. Yeah. And uh, I feel like that's what we have. And it's, uh, Zach is an amazing, amazing kid. And um, there's one funny story to tell you. We were having to go to lunch, and Zach was like, I want chocolate milk. And we're like, Zach, buddy, we'll get you chocolate milk. we got five minutes to go to lunch. It's a union movie. we got to go. And Zach was number one on the call sheet. Yeah. You know, it's always done that way. Shy just walking by goes, number one on the call sheet. Just tell him you're not going. And he was just totally yeah. playing. Was just, so, the set was just so much fun. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> number one on the call sheet. Number one on the call sheet. Get that chocolate milk. And I was like, Shy, you're not helping. Thanks, bud. Um, but the funny thing is um, people see John Bernthal's name. Um and he plays a critical role, which is Tyler's brother. And yeah. we we couldn't find an actor to do that. And Shy picked the phone up and called John on a Monday and was oh, like, wow. hey, man, what are you doing? They yeah. had done uh, some good movies and they remained friends. And he's like, I need you here uh, for this movie to come play my brother. It's 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 not a role that's going to make or break you. It's 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 a really small role. And we just, you yeah. know, and Bernthal jumped on a plane on a Friday, flew out and Hell shot yeah. the last couple of days with us and hung out. And it yeah. was just really cool because every every person that came to set, you know, was was just like this is a good family. Yeah, and so. I, I feel like that's what you hope for, and that's where kind of you know that's where great stuff happens when when everybody's 
feeling it and they're all like equally uh invested in yeah. what's what's happening and to see people like i hadn't seen shia for you know almost two years and i saw him at south by and just to get a chance to chat with them you know because over the course of six weeks of filming you you get to know people and you, yeah. you share that experience and then it's not like you necessarily become friends with these people you're friendly with them and you go right. away and you know, Move you run into them life, somewhere yeah. and say, "Hey, yeah, they just kind of go on." And that's the movie making life. Yeah, um, but it was cool to see him and um, John Hawks is a musician. He's got a band, and he'll text out, "Hey, I'm playing here." So this past weekend, I went and saw his band play. Oh, and, nice! You know, I had the peanut butter yeah. Falcon shirt on, and his girlfriend just loves the film, and she's like, "I want a shirt," and I was like, "Come out to the car." Yeah, you know, get a <laughs> shirt. So it's it's a cool thing, and we come out August 9th and and you know, we're looking forward to getting it out there and see what it can do in theaters awesome well thanks for coming on the bathroom break podcast and check out the trailer right after this uh on on this episode three two one there's sheep in this world and there are wolves in this world and i know that you two boys are just two weary travelers who lost your way so we're going to clean you up right with a baptism. I'm more of a baptism by fire type. OK. Come to my wrestling school and become a badass. That's what he wants to do with the rest of his life. Yes, it is. You let a half-naked boy with Down syndrome who has no idea how to get along in this world just slip out from under your nose. You two are close. We are. Well, then you'll figure out where he's at, and you'll bring him back. Are you following me? Maybe we could be friends and buddies, bro dogs, and chill. Have a good time. So the wrestling school is made? Yes. One long road leads all the way down. I'll drop you there, then. I'm looking for a missing person. Have you seen him? A little man on a lamb. Met your girlfriend back there, Eleanor. Two bandits on the run. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah. Rule number one, don't slow me down. Rule number two, I'm in charge. Hey, what's rule number one? Party. No, not party. Zach, you have a young boy with Down syndrome in the middle of nowhere. All right, well, while you've been doing paperwork, we've been doing something called living. Oh, man. Tyler, I'm going to give you all of my wishes for my birthday. I made a promise to him, give him that wrestling school in Aiden. No, we're not going to hop on your yeah. little raft and cruise around down the river. Hey, Eleanor, I don't want to go home. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So how far is it? About that far on the map. Are your fingers to scale? Yep. I think it's time for us to go back now. We could be a family. Friends are the family you choose. Wrestlers got alter egos. You need a name. Falcon. Peter Butter Falcon! Yeah!